Okay, well, hello, everybody, and I can see that people are still coming in. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, this is our first um, official reader chat that we've done here on Women's Agenda. It's something that we wanted to do this year, uh, regardless of everything that's going on at the moment, but obviously it's perfect timing to try and encourage a little bit more uh, interactivity and to uh, put ourselves out there a little bit more and to really uh, get out there and talk about some of the key issues that we're here discussing on Women's Agenda. So today's discussion is all about raising women's voices in the pandemic. My name is Angela Priestley. I'm the co-founder of Agenda Media, which is the publisher of Women's Agenda. We have our three other uh, regular contributors here. I'll, I'll let each of you introduce yourselves, probably starting with you, Georgie. Hi, guys. I am Georgie Dent, and I am the contributing editor at Women's Agenda and um, coming at you from my home office, which is also my bedroom, um, and thrilled to be here. Yes, I will say one thing that if you do want to uh, let us know where you're listening in from, you can see that there is a panel where you can put comments and you can ask questions. So feel free to shout out and let us know where you are today and what is going on in the background. I imagine many of you are in your homes, uh, maybe the location where you are, you've got kids in the background, what's happening at your place today. Um, over to you, Christina. Hello, um, my name is Christina Zivica and I am also a regular contributor to Women's Agenda. I am coming to you from my home in Melbourne. I've got my two kids here and my dog Harry, so, um, and their father who is a doctor is out at work today, so we will just see how we go. And finally, Neela. Hi everyone, I'm Neela Janikaramanen. I'm a surgeon in Melbourne um, and a regular contributor as well. I'm sitting in my courtyard in Melbourne. It's very cloudy and it may rain and if it does, I may have to run inside, but my kids are inside making a lot of noise. So I thought I would hide out here for a while. Okay, it is a very nice courtyard, I might say. It's, <laughs> Thank you. It's a I won't be the rest of it. <laughs> I know, it's outside as well. So that's such a bonus at the moment. <laughs> Okay, hello, Karen, Amandine, Daniela in Melbourne, Jan in Lismore, um, oh. Helen in Brisbane, uh, here with it. They're, they're with a four year old, Violet. I've got a four year old at home as well. I can tell you it's uh, an interesting age to be <laughs> at home in a house all day with, and oh, lots more coming in. Emma, Michelle, hello to all of you. Um, okay, so. On to our topic. So, I mean, every discussion and push for women's representation on boards and in politics and leadership teams across the community, I really do believe is actually about these unexpected challenges that will occur and how we respond in a way that gets the best possible brains around the table, which is obviously impossible if you miss out on one half of the population, um, but also considers all the implications of the measures being taken. So at this time in the emergency that we are in, I, I also had that moment where I felt it could be easy to think that now's the, not the time to have the discussions about diversity and leadership and the teams that are representing us and, and um, debating these various issues. That now's not the time to speak up about that. But I actually do firmly believe it is the time. And we've, we've done that a fair bit over the last few weeks in some of our coverage on Women's Agenda. And it was a thought that I had particularly a couple of weeks back when I saw the National Task Force Coordination Commission was announced and it, it had just two women on it, that's in Australia. Um, it came up again uh, a few weeks earlier in a few pictures that I saw uh, when I was publishing a piece last week. And that was from this one. And I think it is a picture that tells a thousand words. This is Mike Pence's Coronavirus Task Force. That picture was taken on the 1st of March. I can't tell you for sure if there are no women involved, but there's certainly no women that I can see in that photograph. Um, again, I just think that says a lot about um, some of the ways these task force and groups and, and teams are put together. And at this point, I really firmly believe that, that diversity needs to be absolutely intentional. We can't just reflect back and rely on the fact that we need to go for the most experienced people in the room. That, that's not the case. Nobody's experienced a pandemic like this before. So with that, I wanted to go to each of uh, the, the uh, Women's Agenda contributors and editors that we have here today. So just starting quickly, I mean, why is it that women's leadership is so critical right now? Uh, I might go to you first, Georgie. Yeah, I think that, I mean, w as someone who has sort of been invested in this space and has been writing about women's leadership for a long time, it really is 
it's it's critical at any point that you do have um, decision makers that reflect the communities and the organisations that they're making decisions for. And this is one of those examples where, um, you know, I think one of the interesting things at the moment is that we are all facing a sort of universal force. So the coronavirus is a universal problem that we're all facing. But the way that this crisis plays out for us is very different. And agenda is certainly a, a factor in that. Um, I think that it's really easy to sort of, you know, adopt one um, worldview as sort of the only experience. And we know that that's not the case. You know, I think earlier this week, we, we wrote a story after seeing um, a comment that someone had written about how, you know, if you don't come out of this pandemic with some having fulfilled a long held dream of yours, that basically you didn't lack the time, you lacked the discipline. And as soon as I saw that, I thought it's incredibly um, naive and a very filtered view of what this crisis looks like for a, for a certain person. For a lot of us, merely surviving is going to be a huge achievement. Um, and I don't mean that in a really trite way. I mean it in a really genuine way. There are so many funny memes out there and I have shared so many of them about why sort of being stuck at home with kids and trying to keep everyone afloat is tricky. And there is stuff that's funny about it, but it actually is really difficult. For, for a lot of people, just staying afloat will be a huge um, achievement. And I think that women's voices are critical at this point because of that, um, because we are experiencing this, we are 50% of the population, our experiences are different. So all of the inequities that we already face, we're seeing it already with domestic violence. All of these problems are heightened in this time of crisis. So it makes women's leadership even more important, I would say, than ever. I might go to you, Nilla. What do you think? Um, I guess, I'm sitting in a really unique um, position in all of this because ultimately this is a health crisis. And so as doctors, we are in this position of having to not only take care of our patients, but also take care of ourselves in a, in a health environment that very rapidly is changing. So as a surgeon, for example, I'm quite underemployed at the moment um, and that across the entire surgical workforce has created um, a lot of issues and it's not just the surgical workforce the pediatricians are finding that they aren't seeing as many patients GPs are finding that they're not seeing as many patients um, while the telehealth item numbers are really useful um, and really necessary um, for the population it has had significant impacts on business viability. And so we're in this position where we understand that we need to continue providing services and we're seeing the gendered impacts of this pandemic play out. Um, we worry about uh, women's experiences and children's, in fact, um, experiences of intimate partner violence at times when people are isolated. Um, we worry about whether they will be able to access independent health care if the only way they can access health care is by a telehealth appointment from home where they might be um, under surveillance by a partner. Um, so there are, there are lots of gendered effects on how people have access to health care, but at the same time, in a workforce where the gender pay gap is already 50%, um, as businesses become less and less viable, sometimes the costs of this are unfairly borne by female doctors. Um, and, and not just the business costs, but also the safety issues, um, as most female doctors are primary carers of children, um, we're in a situation where we're looking ahead and we're thinking, well, if there is a surge, if I'm having to work on a COVID ward, if I come home contaminated, um, how do I address my family's safety in this environment in terms of keeping my children under the age of one safe, keeping my other children safe, keeping my partner safe? So from a, from a gender point of view, there are, there are huge impacts um, on healthcare delivery and the medical profession. Mm. And to you, Christina. 
I guess I would just pick up on um, the point that Georgie made earlier about how a crisis like this heightens a number of previously existing crises and issues. And also to pick up on the point that you were making, Angela, about this idea that maybe now is not the time, but if not now, when, I think is the question that some people have asked. And in terms of the kind of crises that were already, you know, gender issues that were already kind of reaching a bit of critical mass, you can look at the undervaluing of women's work, which is a con significant contributor to the pay gap. And now we're looking at precisely those, those female dominated industries where women have been traditionally in low paid and insecure work that are at the front line of this crisis. And, you know, I would hope that when we come out of this, we really reevaluate how we have valued traditionally women's work. And I'm talking about our childcare educators, our teachers, and also, you know, the cleaning staff, our primarily nurses staff and there is evidence that when a, an industry becomes female dominated the pay from a male dominated industry automatically the pay goes down so I think that that's something that we can and we should look at um, but the mental load as well there's significant evidence that women are bearing you know already that was reaching a bit of a critical mass and we had countless books and essays about how women were fed up with carrying the disproportionate mental load um, the, the figures in terms of domestic democracy hadn't shifted in 20 years, so women were still doing the second shift, and we're seeing a real likelihood that in the immediate short term um, that women will be carrying the COVID mental load um, over, over the short to medium term. There were some economists in a piece that I read on CNN yesterday who speculated that this might over the longer term have a really positive effect on gender dynamics because for a number of families where women are working on the front line and then the dads are picking up that load, a bit like Rosie the Riveter, there were a number of Rosie the Riveters who sort of stayed in the workforce because they went out into the workforce. They were, they were postulating that those men would continue to pick up more of the, the, the work on the home front. Um, I hope that proves to be true. Um, and also looking at domestic violence, which was also a critical issue, which will be exacerbated by this problem. Looking at the super gap, um, which I know that Christine from Verve Super raised on Women's Agenda a few days ago. Um, if women access the $20,000 maximum that they can get from their um, super to draw down to get through these tough times, they're already uh, at a significant disadvantage in terms of their super accumulation, and this will place them at a, a, at a further disadvantage. So I think it's really important to look at those ongoing issues in gender and not say, well, we've got, quote unquote, a real crisis now, we have to put those to the side and really consider how the, the pandemic and health crisis, which is clearly having economic and social um, reverberations is exacerbating some of the current gender issues, which I would argue we were already reaching, particularly in domestic violence, critical and crisis points. Yeah, exactly. And it's a really great point, Sarah, talking about the fact that it is exacerbating these existing issues. And I know that a few months ago before this, I wrote a piece looking at climate change, how climate change would exacerbate, particularly gender gaps internationally, if we're looking at things around girls' education and uh, um, child marriage and issues like that. And now I, I just I feel we have to be particularly vigilant at home and looking abroad as well to make sure that things things inevitably will be lost during this process, but that we that we can get it that that we can fight to close the gap of how much is going to be lost. And um, I think I mean you talked about the Economist, Christine. I'd, I'd I'd love to go and read that piece to try and get a positive spin on it. But I I have seen spins on it that go the other way with you know particularly part time and casual work being so right. precarious and those things often being the first jobs to go that it will be fall back to women to really take on a hundred percent of the load at home. And we know that that hundred percent of the load now includes. Uh, uh, remote schooling and and things that many of us have never had to contend with previously. So we wait and see. But the next place where we wanted to take this conversation was to look at some really inspiring examples of female leadership that are happening internationally at the moment and to try and maybe draw some conclusions on what it is about why this leadership is successful. And prior to having this conversation, we also spoke about the fact that we do want to um, retain and be optimistic and have a bit of a positive tone here and look at some of the, the really good things and the inspiring things to try and uh, take us forward from here. So with that, we do have a few examples. We're all going to share a few examples ourselves. Um, so I will start and the 
first place that I'm going to start is to uh, get past this uh, photo of Mike Pence's task force and uh, move on That's to so the, inspiring. <laughs> <laughs> move on to the first female president of Taiwan. This is Tai Ing-wen and uh, she is doing a particularly remarkable job at the moment and if you haven't read it already go and check out Jessie Tu's story on her because I mean I didn't know much about her at all but she is leading with uh, just composure, she's calm, she's measured, she's collaborating, she's acknowledging the many different issues and her country is now in a point where they can actually give back to other countries as well. Um, so Taiwan, uh, Taiwan has a population of 24 million people, so it's just under half the size of Tasmania. And as of Friday last week, it had one of the lowest incidence rate per capita of coronavirus. Um, and last week she declared the country will be donating 10 million masks to countries that are severely affected by COVID-19. And that's pretty incredible when you think about the shortages that are going on, that they are in a position to be able to uh, share those masks. Um, they've delivered a $35 billion stimulus package and they've created a Taiwan Can Help campaign, offering to share their knowledge and experience with countries all over the world. Another example I have here is Erna Solberg, who's the Prime Minister of Norway. Um, she's, she's long been known to have steered the country through, through its oil crisis, they've avoided a recession, but she's also known to put a real uh, like humanistic kind of point on, on their, their policies and emphasise people's, people's needs first um, when it comes to their, you know, they do have a conservative fiscal stance. She also frequently discusses women's rights. Um, she came to our attention on Women's Agenda a couple of weeks ago when she delivered this amazing press conference to children. And I think that might actually be a photo of her delivering that press conference there, where she just really calmly answered the questions of, the, of, of kids that came up. So only kids were allowed in and it was broadcast to kids' media. And it just all had those simple questions of, you know, why can't I go to this birthday party? When can I see my grandparents? Just things that our kids are feeling now that, that she had the foresight to think, hey, I'm going to sit down and we'll stand up rather and address every single one of these questions and I think Jacinda Ardern has gone and done something similar since. Um, she also responded to the call from the UN Secretary General regarding the need to acknowledge the rise of domestic violence during this period and the final one that I'll uh, point to here is uh, the German Vice Chancellor Angela Merkel. Um, so Germany has had a strong response to coronavirus and um, Merkel has been clear and consistent in her communications the whole time. She's been open, she's been transparent. Uh, this photo was taken from quite a memorable speech that she gave to camera about two weeks ago where she just really laid it all on the line and just called for Germans to say, you know, this is serious, we need to take it seriously. So that's my three examples. Georgie, I believe we have, um, oh no, sorry, I did want to show, I, I mean, I had that still from the previous, uh, from two weeks ago, but I couldn't really resist putting these pictures together and not showing this one from a couple of years back, which I love to see this. She just looks like she is in total control, which she is. Uh, so Georgie, I'll go to you now. Uh, Jacinda Ardern was um, an obvious one to put on our list. Tell us about yeah, she is, and look, I mean, the, the woman can barely do any wrong, can she? I think, I think what I have found really um, reassuring about her leadership in this time is that she, she sort of, I think she proves how much strength there is in vulnerability because I think one of the unique aspects of the way that she has communicated through this crisis is she has been really decisive and she has been... Um, really honest, I think, with the people of New Zealand. She has, I think, revealed her own vulnerability. She said that this is really difficult. I don't think that she has pretended to have all of the answers, but I think that she has, um, in just the way that she has communicated in the Facebook messages that she's doing from her own home in her tracksuit after having put, you know, her toddler to bed, I think she sort of shows a humanity that we haven't seen in political leadership, not not when we're talking about a head of state. And I think it's in the sort of very traditional macho style of leadership, it is, you know, the idea that you stand up and you tell the people exactly what's happening and why it's happening and you don't, you know, there's nothing about you that's vulnerable. And I think she's the complete opposite to that. And it almost counterintuitively, the impact is that it is so reassuring. 
I listen to what she's saying and I believe what she's saying. I think because she is vulnerable and she's not pretending to be some sort of um, messiah, but she's just telling, you know, she's saying this is a difficult time. These are difficult decisions. Our lives are changing. Um, and I think that I personally, particularly in the first few weeks of this crisis, I found listening to her briefings really reassuring on a personal level, not just as sort of a bystander watching um, this sort of masterclass in leadership, but as someone who was taking on that message and thinking, I think that advice um, is just as relevant here in Australia as it is in New Zealand. Mm. Okay, I think, Neela, we're on to a couple from the medical community um, that you could speak to. I just want to, just one thing before you go there, I can see that uh, uh, Sally there is asking about the CNN article and I can't share it at the moment, but I can tell you it's called Millions of Dads Are Stuck at Home, which could be a game changer for working mums. So if you Google that, that would come up. And we'll also share that in the notes that go along with this recording. So Neela, over to you. Mm, so my um, couple of examples probably need a little bit more introduction because they're not public figures really outside the medical world. Um, so Dr. Dara Cass is an emergency physician uh, in New York. And I met her um, at a couple of sort of gender equity panels this time last year, she was in Australia. And she's one of those people who is such a remarkable ordinary person that you might actually want to hate them a little bit. Um, so she's got three kids. She's an emergency physician. She, um, her, one of her children required a liver transplant a number of years ago. And so she donated part of her liver to her son. And while she was recovering from that, she did a real estate license. So in addition to being an emergency physician, she also sells houses in New mm -hmm. York. Um, but she, <laughs> Why not? Why not? she's <laughs> also an incredible gender equity advocate. She founded an organization called Feminem, um, the EM being for emergency medicine, bringing together female emergency physicians across the US. And they do a whole bunch of gender equity in medicine research. And the other thing that they do is they um, offer job matching services. So they actually look at hospitals and how gender equitable they are and um, provide candidates to sort out their gender balance. So just incredibly impressive um, individual all round. But at the start of the pandemic, um, and for those who haven't followed what's happening in New York, it's an absolute catastrophe at the moment. But when the writing first came on the wall about six weeks ago, um, Dara sent her son wow. to live with her parents um, because he was immunosuppressed, having received an organ transplant. Um, and she wrote extensively about this decision at the time, saying that there was a surge that was coming and that her son's greatest risk actually was her because she would be on the front line. Um, so she sent her son, her, well, all of her kids away to live with her parents. And she subsequently did go and work on the front line and she did get infected by coronavirus and she then recovered from it. And while she was recovering from it, she continued to see patients by telehealth. And since that time, she has been basically everywhere in the news media to talk about all of the issues that doctors around the world are facing, but seem particularly bad in the US in terms of not having access to adequate personal protective equipment, not having adequate um, workplace support, safety, um, all of these things that actually make it possible to go to work. And unfortunately, as we've seen already in Italy and are starting to see in the UK and now the US, we're seeing frontline healthcare workers actually not only getting infected, but actually dying as a consequence. Um, so, you know, she, to, it, it's the rare person who can take that combination of experiences and translate that to advocacy for doctors and for patients at a national level um, as articulately as she has. And I think that for that reason, she's probably a bit of a shining light. Apologize for the aeroplane. Um, the other person I want to talk about is actually an Australian um, anaesthetist. If you want to flick to the next slide, Ange, or I can. Um, so, you know, Susie Nu is, is one of many, many um, very impressive doctors in Australia who are driving change at sort of local hospital and systemic levels. Um, but the reason I thought I'd, I'd talk about her briefly is she's currently the president of the Australian Society of Anaesthetists. And 
about three weeks ago, they um, and she and the organisation released a statement and they were the first people to say that we had to stop elective surgery. Um, there were lots of reasons for this. Part of it was that we needed to conserve what protective equipment that we have for a potential um, marked increase in sick patients. Um, it was in part because bringing patients into a hospital environment, uh, I, I talk about hospitals with my patients like cruise ships, you know, there's just, there's infection everywhere. And so if you can avoid that environment, then you're going to get less community transmission. Um, and this was a really brave thing to do for lots of reasons. Um, so the Australian Society of Anaesthetists is actually the organisation for private anaesthetics in Australia. And so basically what this call was, was a call to say we have to place medicine ahead of ourselves and the anaesthetists of Australia are willing to reduce their income basically to zero in order to stop elective surgery, allow hospitals time to plan for what may or may not be coming um, and preserve what equipment that there is for, for that time. So this was quite a visionary thing. Um, she copped a lot of flack for it. Um, and some weeks later, we did see uh, elective surgery come to a halt. Um, but, you know, she was, she was a couple of weeks ahead of the curve, if you'll pardon the pun, um, on that. But, you know, these are just a couple of examples. And I think that for what I expect is probably a mostly lay audience, the reassurance that I would give you is that our hospitals are full of incredible people, incredible women, um, often women who have not previously held leadership roles. Because there is so much change happening at the moment, it's a real opportunity for young, dynamic people, especially women, to go back to their organisation and say, I'm going to take control of this part of this problem. I've ad identified this problem and I just want to fix it. And so what we're seeing is a decade's worth of change sweeping through our health systems in a very, very short period of time and often driven by <coughs> women. And I'm really proud to see that and be part of it. Mm, okay. And uh, finally, uh, Christina, a bit of a different example now. Uh, in the US, tell yes. us about Katie Porter. So this is um, Representative Katie Porter. And a few weeks ago on March 12th, which seems like a lifetime ago, um, she was questioning the, sorry, that's my dog barking. <laughs> she was questioning the CDC chief and got him to agree to pay for free coronavirus testing for everyone in the United States, which um, obviously from my accent and if you know a little bit about me and my background, I did grow up in the US um, and I am I, I lived in New York for 10 years. So I still follow politics and events there closely and I'm extremely sensitive to the fact that part of the reason that this has played out so catastrophically in the United States is that their healthcare, they don't really have a strong um, public, they don't have a public healthcare system. It's um, privatized and a lot of people were not getting tested partly because there weren't tests, but also because they couldn't afford it. So it, this was really um, quite a key um, win for Representative Porter, but the way that she went about it and the way that she just she just kept saying, I think the um, the recording of it went viral on social media. She just kept saying, reserving my time and just kept hammering away at the point. She had a little um, whiteboard that she was scribbling um, the potential impacts if, if they didn't um, make testing available for free and the costs, um, which is arguably a far better use of a whiteboard in politics. And I don't know who I could possibly <laughs> otherwise be referring to um so that really that went viral and i think that that was a really um profound and early example of the importance of diversity in leadership and in politics and um, representative porter has a strong history of this as well so she's the only single mother with young children to serve in congress and she's part of um, she's done a number of things to make sure that more women run for our office but particularly with women with young children because she thinks it's really important to bring that perspective to the table and to fight for that constituency um, and to fight for other marginalized constituencies as well so she's part of a PAC um, public action committee called Mama Vote which is supporting more women and women with young children to enter politics and she has also um, implemented or introduced the Help America Run Act which um, if passed uh, would 
allow working parents running for office to use campaign funds for health insurance premiums and child and elder and dependent care, which would obviously have massive implications and be one of those structural changes that really assists more women and women with caring responsibilities to serve in public office. And she's part of that new wave of um, women in um, more and more diverse women with different life experiences who have um, really come to the forefront in, in US politics. And I think you can see um, the impact in, in this viral clip, um, but also in her other work of having that diversity of voices in politics. Mm. Yes, so amazing examples. Thank you everyone for um, bringing those together. So hopefully they just show a bit of the uh, women's leadership, what it's doing internationally. Uh, the final question that I wanted to put to all of us and and then we'll throw it out to just if, if anybody has any questions that they'd like to raise or issues that you'd like to raise, please let us know. Um, but I mean, I just from uh, all your perspectives, what do you feel needs to actually happen now to ensure that more women are getting heard at this time? Are we too late to get more women heard at this time? What we can do? What can we do to make sure that those voices are raised uh, during the pandemic? Uh, Georgie, I'll start with you. And we can't hear your kids in the background, by the way. Well, I certainly can't, or maybe other people can. But Yeah, I, I have actually, I put a note in the message. I, it sounds like they're rearranging the furniture, like every bit of furniture in the whole house. So I did ask them not to come in here and they were quite offended. They asked why people wouldn't want to see them. Um, anyway. Maybe, maybe they're locking you in there. Maybe they're just boarding up like certain chairs and beds are coming up there. I, uh, look, I'm going to cross my fingers and say I wouldn't mind that if that was the reality just for an hour or so. <laughs> um, it's, in terms of what can we do now, I don't think it's too late. I, I, think, I think there's a couple of interesting things here. Obviously, leadership comes in so many different shapes and forms, and I think that everyone has touched on that in the examples that they've given. Obviously, some are, you know, Jacinda Ardern is a very classic, traditional example of power and leadership because she is you know, a leader of a country. But there's also incredible leadership on an individual level that people are doing in, um, in workplaces, whether it's in hospitals, whether it's in schools. And I do think, actually, I did want to briefly touch on, um, I think one of the realities at the moment is we know that schools and childcare centres are largely still open and available. We know that the uh, workforce is predominantly women. So you've got a whole lot of women on a very different front line of this virus, not like healthcare um, professionals who this is the space they work in. Um, so, you know, so emergency doctors or nurses in ICU, they expect these, this, this sort of work is what they do. It's what they're trained for. Teachers and early childhood educators are not trained necessarily to be on the front line of a health crisis, but they are right now. And I have to say that um, the teachers uh, that my daughters have have done an incredible job, I feel, in, in sort of taking on a whole new um, role, effectively, in trying to now somehow run a virtual classroom. The, the um, director of the childcare centre where they go, I see the way they're adapting and responding and trying to um, appease parents' concerns, um, appease children's concerns, trying to... Um, keep some semblance of peace and sanity for the children that they're looking after all the while they're sort of putting themselves at risk and facing the whole um you know all of the other risks that all of us are facing at this time and i just want to say i think that it's important to recognize that that leadership is leadership and that it's happening um you know right across the world right now it's not just the sort of traditional leaders but in the traditional leadership realm i do think that you know, here in Australia, it has been revealed how, um, you know, once again, we know we don't have enough women in traditional decision making roles. Um, and I think that is visible at the moment, you know, most of our political leaders who we're seeing and hearing from the most, they're not females. Um, you know, there certainly are some women in the mix. And I think it's, um, you know, that's reassuring. But I think you can't really get around the fact that we don't have nearly as many female voices um, as I would like us to see as I think that would benefit all of us but I think that we can definitely take heart in knowing that there are incredible women doing amazing things right now in this space and that they will be and they have to be part of the recovery um, I think none of us know exactly how this 
pandemic will pandemic will play out from here. We don't know what the recovery period is going to look like from a health perspective or from an economic perspective. There's so many variables. And I think that we all have to be really vigilant about ensuring that women's voices are heard and that women are visible. And obviously that's easy for us to say here at Women's Agenda because it is what we do. Um, you know, we aim to amplify the voices of women and, and their experiences um, in a way that isn't done um, elsewhere. And I think it's important to keep doing that um, now more than ever. Yes, uh, Georgie, just taking your point, I wanted to respond to something that uh, Jennifer has shared about asking about um, views about how women, and it's mainly women, are expected to work from home and raise children and homeschool them. I mean, it really, that these are impossible demands that are being asked of all of us. And um, Jennifer, I actually think you make the point there and it's not being adequately recognised. And this is an opportunity for leaders in whatever area it's in, but particularly in business right now, to adequately recognise what these additional tasks that women are taking on. And they're not taking this on by choice. This is the reality that we're in, but there is an opportunity for leaders in business to recognise the, the, the strain on people's physical and mental ability to keep up with their workloads right now, mm -hmm. and also the exhaustion that may occur later on as a result of this. So I firmly believe that this is an opportunity. I would also like to see um, a, a little bit more leadership on that from at the broader level in terms of acknowledging what, what really does need to be done in terms of remote schooling. I mean, do we need to try and, I think, Georgia, you've raised this point, I've heard you say, where we don't need to sit there and try and replicate the school system, but I'd like to hear that messaging coming across over and over again, that it's about doing, you know, whatever you can really. This is emergency schooling, it's not homeschooling. We can't be expected to figure out how to do this in the space of weeks, nor can we necessarily expect teachers and the education system. Um, you mentioned the childcare workers there and I've got that experience from our childcare centre as well who are sending us all these amazing resources and videos and various other things that they're doing. Incredible that they've been able to adapt and I've seen this from, my, from our school, from the primary school too and they're doing this on top of actually having kids still in the centre or still in the schools on top of the fact that they are also at home possibly managing their own kids as well. So just to acknowledge all this work's going on and acknowledge the fact that we can't be expected <laughs> to replicate the school system. Georgia. No. And can I, I just want to add something there because I have seen a comment um, from, from Andrea who said she doesn't, she has to play the devil's advocate and say that while she's frantically focused on her, on the business at the moment, her husband has really stepped up and he's doing the homeschooling and the meal preps and he's also working from home. And I think that is absolutely, I don't think there's anything um, about devil's advocate there. I think that is the reality for lots of um, people. If you, if two parents are working at home, um, the, the dynamic that's playing out, I don't think it is just the traditional women do everything and men do nothing. I know from my own um, conversations with friends, when there's two people at home, they have to split the school, the homeschooling and the domestic jobs because you're both in the same space and that's what you're doing. And I think that um, it's certainly not a case that women are doing absolutely everything on the home front. Um, mm. Yeah, I, that, I completely agree. And I have to say that, you know, I have a partner who is sharing this responsibility with me and sharing it as we speak. He is in another room currently doing some homeschooling. I do agree with you, although I do think that we are in a position, and I always like to talk about working parents and everything we do on Women's Agenda. We try to really stress the idea of working parents, that it's not only about, about um mums or it's not about you know, being working mums we prefer to say working parents but I think I just feel in this case we really need to acknowledge the fact that in the majority of households women will be taking on the bulk of that responsibility ideally it yeah. won't be like that and ideally I want to go to Christina's world in that CNN piece that says that you know after all this we'll all see the value of sharing the responsibilities but um, yeah well, just getting to your point about Angela about whether or not it's too late or if we can factor in gender or take a, you know, as, as the anoraks would say, a gender lens to the implications of this pandemic. I absolutely think it's, you know, it, it feels like everything is happening, it, you know, heightened at the moment. And this, the, 
while on the one hand, it seems like the days are very, very slow, <laughs> um, particularly if you're at home with your children. On the other hand, it seems like, you know, the, the world changes overnight from day to day. So um, I have been really encouraged and heartened, and I think it's great that we're going to share some resources. Um, and I will also do a bit of a thread on Twitter because I've really read a lot of excellent articles that have done just that. Um, you know, Sonia Palmieri did a great piece um, that looked at the special sitting of parliament and women's representation within that. And I'm sure she'll be looking at the special sitting today and crunching the numbers again as well. So she highlighted the fact that while we would normally have 30% women's representation, that went down to 23%. And while they spent three hours and 45 minutes debating the special COVID bill legislation, women only spoke for 40 minutes. So there is that kind of accountability. There are women at the forefront looking at those issues. Gender Equity Victoria put together a coalition of 50 organizations to say we absolutely need to have a gendered response to the pandemic. Um, that mirrors what the Fawcett Society in the UK has done. And um, I know that my mate Sam Smethers, who's the CEO of the Fawcett Society, has had a similar conversation to this one um, with various individuals, just making sure that we need to and we continue to take that gendered lens as we um you know, as we go forward. And it's just looking at the, like the long tail of this as well. So I can remember, or I've been thinking a lot about um, the austerity budget that was introduced in the UK when I was working at the Human Rights Commission. And um, the austerity budget was partly a result of the global financial crisis. So, um, you know, they spent a lot of money on that as we are spending a lot of money now responding to this crisis. But the women, it was women who were disproportionately impacted acted by that austerity budget, so much so that a coalition of women's organizations actually filed a judicial review because the government had failed to take into account the disproportionate impact on women of that budget. So when we, you know, when we move on or get past, build this, you know, mythical bridge that we're building and questions are raised about how we're going to pay for this or how we're going to pay down the deficit, we have to make sure that that is not also, you know, we have to keep our eye on the ball and make sure that that, um, that price or those cuts in services are not disproportionately borne by women over the longer term. So it's good that we're talking about how this is impacting women in the here and now um, in crisis response, but I think we need to keep our eye on that. Um, but I think that there are a number of, of leaders in this country, a number of experts, um, the women's organization, Romy Listo at the Equality Rights Alliance, um, Emma Dawson wrote a great piece for Women's Agenda from Per Capital earlier this week, I've really been heartened to see that we've got some really smart, committed thinkers um, thinking this through, and um, they will continue to be looking at these issues, I think, over the short to longer term. Mm. Um, Neela, I do want to get to you as well. Um, I just want to just acknowledge that we're getting some amazing comments coming through and mm. try and uh, get to them in a second. But Neela, I'll just go to you first. Um, I guess one of the things that I really reflected on over the last few weeks is in January, if someone had said to me, look, by April, you're going to be in the middle of a global pandemic and tens of thousands of people will have died, I probably would have shrugged and said, oh, that sounds bad, but believable. But if anyone had said to me that we would now have a society where we had free childcare and New Start had doubled and the Prime Minister was talking about everyone who works in any capacity is essential to the economy. I would have said, no, no that's never going to happen. You know, I'll put my house on it. Not a chance. And so I think, I think there, you know, we, we focus on gender equity because that inequity is the biggest one in society. Women are 50% of the population and it's really, um, not easy, but, but it's an obvious and visible target to discuss inequity. But I think what this has really demonstrated is that as a society, we accept inequity in a lot of different ways. We accept that some people are just going to be poor. We accept that we're not going to help people with disabilities as much. We accept all sorts of things. And I think that what has become very clear in this pandemic is that um, and I'll, I'll borrow from other smarter people than me, but this sort of capitalism only works when you've got socialism to back it up. 
as the escape plan. So I think it is it is not just about how we fix gender inequity going forwards. It's actually more about keeping um, the idea that everyone is important at the front of everything. Um, you know, looking at the health system, it was great when the federal government bailed out the private health system and said, now we have an extra 34,000 beds for Australians in this pandemic. And, you know, and I say this as a surgeon who works within the private system, the question to me is why aren't those 34,000 beds available to everyone every day of the week? And I think that, you know, I, I hope we don't go back to normal. I hope we go back or we move forwards to something different um, and something that acknowledges that every life does actually have value and every contribution, whether it's paid or unpaid, actually contributes to the economy and that we are a society, we're not individuals. And so if we don't actually learn to value everyone, then things will fall apart. Mm, absolutely. What amazing points. Thank you, everybody. Um, we've had some really great comments come through and I've noticed that some comments go to the panellists and attendees, but a lot of comments are actually only coming through to the panellists. So um, I, I just wanted to make note of some of those comments and questions. So I might do a bunch of them all at once. And then if any of our panellists have any final thoughts on any of these, then we can go through those. Um, one uh, acknowledging uh, their union, the IEU, proud of their members, 77% female, who are on the front line of education, care and support. Another one saying that post the pandemic, and this goes to your point, Neela, as well, that our recovery requires a task force that must be balanced and include women. There are many women leaders out there showing leadership who could be earmarked for the task force. Good point. Um, we had Andrea's comment about the need to talk about working parents. Um, we have uh, another point noting that um, some from uh, Lucia, the CEO of uh, Women for Election, uh, noting that we know for sure that they need to have more women, more diverse voices and more lived experience in our parliamentary chambers, aid the response and recovery has never been greater but there lies the rub. If women make up the majority of the teachers, nurses, childcare workers, aged care workers, casual workforce and homeschoolers currently under pressure, how can they consider running for office? This is an excellent point. We already know that women had many barriers to entry and running for elections, but it feels like the scales have been tipped further. Women are in a very difficult place at the moment. My hope is that the, this crisis along with the bushfires creates it in their belly, which will translate to political engagement and even running. Good point, Lucia. I think we need a piece on that on women's agenda. Mm -hmm. um, so more around um, uh, the need to discuss older women too. Um, also uh, a comment asking if it's more, if, if it's feminine energy that leads to, to men stepping up. Um, also a comment on the need to collect data on the division of labour on the domestic front right now. I agree that would be amazing stats to collect and particularly going forward, what the incredible things that we can do there. Um, also from Kath, who um, is uh, a leader and a voice for women with gynecological um, uh, and an advocate for there, um, a cancer survivor with a daughter who has endometriosis. Uh, which approximately 2 million young Australian women have. Um, and she notes her concerns that the effects of women suffering in silence with gynecological health issue, issues within this pandemic and would value a comment on how these women can cope during isolation with partners and family. I think maybe, Neela, you might have something to say for that. I know that even when it comes to endometriosis, I saw that that came up in your piece a week or so ago. Um, another comment about the need to look at the diversity of the term women, which mm. is obviously really important, and we'll speak to that. Um, and I, I think I'll just stop there because there's a lot that, that that's come through. But Neela, did you have any comments there at all? Um, I was slightly distracted by my child who was jumping a fence. So... <laughs> They're escaping isolation. <laughs> so I was looking up, this head just appeared and then he's jumping two stories. So if you could repeat the question, I'd be very grateful. Can I put it? Because one thing you wrote a piece about the heartbreak of having to describe mm. to your patients who mm. are awaiting um, elective surgery that they need to wait, that their health issues need to wait. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't know if you have any comments or anything that you can say there about, you know, how people can cope during this period of isolation. 
I think what I would say is remember that we're all here. Um, there will be, there may be, and this is by no means a guarantee because the social distancing is working really well and we actually have no idea what the next six months are going to look like. There may be a short period of time where the medical workforce is consumed in dealing with COVID, but for the rest of the time, we're all still here. The GP clinics are still open. The surgeons' rooms are still open. The public hospitals are still open. And so, and one of the things that we've really seen as a medical community is the number of presentations um, to all of these healthcare um, points of contact have really dropped off. Um, mm -hmm. And that makes us worry. And that makes us worry a lot because it means that people with chronic health conditions aren't getting or seeking normal care. Maybe people are putting up with their chest pain instead of going to hospital because they're worried about whether they might be exposed or not. Mm. Um, we don't want to get to the end of this and find that people are sicker than they need to be. Accepting that at some fundamental level, people are going to be a little bit sicker than they otherwise might have been. Um, so, you know, what I've said to my patients is that I might not be able to operate on everyone, but I can give everyone some sort of technique to help them cope over the next six months. And, you know, for example, if they've got something like carpal tunnel syndrome, they've got a lot of pain in their hand, I can do a steroid injection. It won't fix the problem, but it will, it'll tide you over. And I think most specialists would have something like that up their sleeve. And similarly, um, GPs can do lots of things both for physical health and mental health issues um, and the most spectacular thing about this pandemic for healthcare in this country is that we have been dragged kicking and screaming into the telehealth era. Um, our public hospitals have seen, I kid you not, five to ten years of progress within two or three weeks. Um, and most private practices, both GP practices and specialist practices, are now fully telehealth enabled. Um, so what that means is that if you live in the country and you need to see a specialist in the city, call them and ask if you can telehealth it and it will almost certainly be possible. And similarly with your GPs, don't be scared of the health system. We're all still here and we can, we can help get you through this. Mm. Okay, well, we might need to finish up in a couple of minutes, but any final comments from Christina, Georgie? Um, no, I mean, I was just, I think that's terrific advice um, from Neela there. I was going to say, as somebody that does have chronic health conditions, um, I have been, um, I've had a few things to navigate in terms of non-urgent procedures and what to do. Is this the period I have not wanted to be unnecessarily going into um, hospitals? Um, but I think it is, and I have been so um, grateful for the option of, I haven't actually used telehealth yet, but I've been able to have virtual conversations online with a couple of my specialists and it just does make it so much easier to navigate. Um, and so I would say to anyone that is in a sort of chronic health condition situation that there is, it's, there is still fortunately help available. Um, in a different form. I think the one um, comment that has come up there that I just wanted to touch on briefly is the um, the diversity within the Labor women. And I think that it is, as ever, um, really worth turning our minds to because it goes a little bit to what I said earlier about there not being a single universal experience for anybody in this crisis. But there's certainly no blanket experience for women. Um, there are really different ways that women can and will suffer um, during this crisis, the same way there are a variety of ways women suffer, um, even when we're not living through a health crisis. And I think that um, being really forensic about that and opening the mind to, to that, to the fact that everyone's experience is very different and there are some structural factors at the moment that you cannot get around that will inform an individual's experience of this pandemic and um, yeah, that's, it's critical to just keep that in mind at all times. Yes. And just um, to pick up on, I think, I think it was Georgie who made that point. I think it, we really will um, think about leadership very differently after this and women's leadership. And I know that both Neela and Georgie have made a special point of 
you know, acknowledging the, the women out there and the leaders out there in communities who aren't necessarily high profile political figures. Um, you know, the principal at my, or Mila's at my kid's school, the teachers at that school. It's just, um, you know, in a crisis, people are stepping up to the plate and showing a lot of leadership in a lot of different ways and a lot of emotionally intelligent <laughs> leadership. Um, we've had a master class in it from Jacinda Ardern, but I have found it um, just absolutely reassuring to get the occasional email from the kids' school principal that just says, you know, I believe in our school community, I believe in our values, we can do this. And it's those things at every level of society, which I, I think after the fact, um, or perhaps we can take a moment to pause in the midst of it and just acknowledge those people who are showing and, and pulling their businesses through, pulling their employers through. Um, and, and helping us get to the other side of this. Yeah, absolutely. So we will need to finish up. So thank you everybody for, for listening in. Um, I wanna give an email address because I can see that there are questions and other things that are coming through that we may not have adequately addressed. So we can look at how we, if we, if we have our answers to them or if we, uh, if they might inspire future pieces for us on women's agenda as well. So you can get in contact at contact at womensagenda.com.au. Um, and we will do more of these reader chats. So if you have any feedback as well on how it went or future topics or ideas, then please uh, use that email address as well. It would be great to hear from you. A reminder also that uh, if you don't already, you can subscribe to our daily newsletter, which comes out just before lunchtime here in Australia. It's uh, go to womensagenda.com.au forward slash subscribe. And we have spoken to a lot of pieces that we've published over the past few weeks on Women's Agenda. So I'll do what we can when we do end up sharing the recording of this, uh, this session to include the links to those pieces also. So thank you, Christina, Georgie and Neela and we'll officially sign off. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.